Thank you for coming. How many enjoy the heat? Yeah, that's a stupid question. <laughs> I tell you what, I'm thankful for air conditioning. My goodness. Well, let's open the service with a word of prayer and then just will lose their singing. Lord, thank you so much for the freedoms we have in our country and we praise you for how you blessed us. Would you help us to remember that and praise you for it and not take it for granted. Would you bless us in this service? Be with us and help us to listen to your voice in your name. Amen. Grab the hymnal, please. Let's begin by turning number 646. 646.
information right now. And I know there's a lot of concern and even disagreements on where our country's headed, but we still live in a free country and we have a lot to be thankful for. And I'm still proud to be American. I'm not proud of everything our country stands for, but I'm still proud to be American. If you compare our, our nation to other nations in the world, it's not a real good comparison. We just are really blessed. Is there someone that has something to share this morning? We feel very blessed. Um, the Lord got built through another little episode and uh, got along fine. We have some tests to have done. But um, I'm just so thankful for that. And I'm also thankful for uh, our country, exactly the way you say, uh, not proud of what they're doing. But really, uh, we have been so blessed, and uh, I'm so thankful for how the Lord is with us every day. Uh, through all the unexpected things on our part, he's always there, not, not surprised, and so I'm very thankful. Bill got bored the other night, so decided to go to the hospital and visit him for a while. He has a neat thing. Echo coming up here this week says, pray that turns out well. Somebody else? Actually, a real uh, sign of maturity when you can do that. I don't want to miss the opportunity to thank the Lord. We are good. I appreciate this picture. Yes, we do live in a great nation. And in a troubled world. And I have a lot of concerns. I have three granddaughters working with the virus, right with them. One is x-ray uh, people with virus. And she's expecting in about a month and a half. And one said she moved in with to that area to relieve the nurses that was there. They looked so tired and worn out. So she volunteered to work with and the doctor's with it all the time in our hospital. That's my three granddaughters. I have two new expectant mothers. And they're to the place now they're concerned about, are, am I going to know when to go? And she has a distance from the hospital. And, and the other one's still working at the hospital. But she's going to quit one of these times until this <laughs> new thing's over. They have the jitters, which we all had the first time. So I, I need to pray for them. I heard the vice president give his testimony this morning. Okay. And I'm encouraged. I, I've learned that our president and his wife prays. So that's encouragement to me. I see the Christians are really standing up. And I thank God for that. Amen. Praise his holy name. Yeah, Christians need to stand up to pray for sure. I don't, I don't, I'm just thinking, Mark, if you have a granddaughter that's due soon 
and she's already in the hospital. Yeah, that person. one, that's not the one that's worried. The one that lives up Path Valley is the one that's oh, worried okay. about getting there on top. <laughs> yeah, see, she's already there. She's in good shape. <laughs> Somebody else? Please, try to request. Cancer seems to be about as contagious, if not more, than the coronavirus. We pray for his salvation. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people struggling with that. Susie? Pray, uh, pray for Steve's brother, Mark. He has to have a watchman put in his heart because he has AIDS there. And uh, he's getting up now, I think, to sleep. Pray for Steve's brother. Pray, continue to pray for Andrew. Oh. He's back better now, but still has a little scar. Let's really pray for Andrew. Most of you. Uh, <clears throat> are familiar with the name Jimmy Keaton. I've been telling you about him. He had um, kidney cancer. And uh, had one kidney removed back in March, and then uh, another third of the other kidney removed here in May, I think it was. April, somewhere in there. Anyhow, he's been going to dialysis three or four times a week. They cut him back to once a week, and they just got him, told him here about three or four days ago that he's good to go. Totally amazing, and I did not expect to hear that, but I should have been having a little more faith in God than that. He is beyond this ecstatic, and I just thank the Lord for that. I still cannot believe how two-thirds of a kidney can do the function of the whole body. It just amazes me. And how do you get everything connected right that it does its job? Anyone else? Keep praying for Peggy, Tim and Glenda. Praying for Al. Monica? Obviously pray for rain. Yeah, we need rain. I was thinking the other day about Elijah, Elijah, Elisha, with the, with the standing on the mountain. He said, I see this, a cloud the size of a man's fist. Well, I saw some clouds bigger than a man's fist, but they didn't do much. <laughs>
Would you help each one in our church that is here this morning? Would you give them a special blessing for being here? Would you help those that are missing for various reasons? Be with them where they're at and you help them in your presence. We thank of those that are struggling physically and some of the prayer requests we heard here today. Continue to be with Al. Give him just a, a special touch of your presence and, and healing. And be with Darlene. Give her peace. Be with Tim and Glenda. You're there in their home this morning. Would you give Tim a special touch? If it's your will to heal him, Lord, would you just miraculously heal him and, and give Glenn the peace, Glenda the peace that she needs? Be with Peggy this morning as she's struggling physically. Would you be with her? <clears throat> be with Andrew in a special way. Get a hold of his heart and help him to see how, how real you can be to him. Give Doug a special touch. Encourage him. Help Michelle as well. We praise you for the way you've been with Jimmy Keaton and Lord continue to give him strength and healing. Continue to be with Mark as he is struggling with ALS and his wife as well. Give her a special touch as she's helping him. Be with Bill this week as he has a test and would you help that to come back good and uh, have everything to work out well there. Be with this neighbor of Dean that has cancer. Ken, Lord, would you uh, help him? And also, Lord, would you show yourself real to him that he knows um, that he can know you as his personal Savior. And then be with Steve's brother. She's having heart problems. Give him a special touch. And then, Lord, we're all around us, desperately in need of rain. Would you see fit to do that for us and help the farmers that are relying on this for their livelihood? Would you just uh, work a miracle here? We thank you and praise you, Lord, for our church and the wonderful group of people we have and our family. Would you encourage each one in you and help us to look for others around us that need encouragement and maybe through you we can fill that, that gap. Bless us in this service. In your name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so most of you got the phone tree announcement should have that Sunday school starts next Sunday. And so I'm not going to go into all the details of that, but the short story is we're back on regular schedule at 9.30 with Sunday school. Of course, there's no service tonight, and then this Friday night, our men's group at 6.30. There's not, ladies' group is next Friday. Is there any announcements I'm missing? I feel like that's not enough. Karen, I forgot we didn't have actual offering. Yeah. See, I'm two and a quarter years from 40, and I think when you hit 40, things start to slip. Yeah. <laughs> Would you want to play just play that for us? Can you have another song? Okay. Jeez. I just want to hear that song, Statue of Liberty, again. How many know that song? It's a good one. I almost feel like it is. It's not. Okay. We'll listen to that, and then... Uh, and then we're having another uh, congregation.
a really good song to go along with the message. I don't know how many of you know all the words to that song, Karen played Statue of Liberty. Um, there's also a version that uses the cross as our Statue of Liberty. And it says at the end of it, as the statue liberates the citizen, so the cross liberates my soul. It doesn't matter where you're living. If you have Jesus in your heart, you're free. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain un unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Who here under 10 years old knows what that was? When you know what that was? Yeah. I didn't know what that was. Good job. You <laughs> saved. <laughs> so most of you should have recognized those famous words, just like you'd recognize four score and three years ago. <clears throat> These words, I fear, have been greatly disrespected here in the last number of years. And you'll see in those words a definite connection to God as a sustainer and provider. Yesterday we celebrated America's independence. Is that 257 years, something like that? Without doing my math real quickly. 44? Um, and I wonder if those that celebrated some felt like it was more of a mockery than a celebration. In recent months, there's just been this great outcry by many Christians that what our leaders are doing is unconstitutional, it's anti American. The argument is that they're defying our Constitution and mocking our early founders, their desire for a free country. And to that I say with as much humility as I can without acting like a know-it-all, you're greatly misled if you believe that. It isn't at all about ignoring political documents or amendments. It goes a whole lot deeper than that. <clears throat> this country was founded by men who believed in the value of going to God and seeking his guidance and will in their personal lives and also in the direction of their country. The problem today isn't an abandonment of our Constitution, but an abandonment of God. Turn your Bibles, please, to Psalms 85. God has been taken out of everything. And until he's invited back into our country, there's going to continue to be a downward spiral. And I'm going to say this emphatically. If you think the answer to this current situation that we're facing right now, or any like it that seems to be splitting our country apart, if you think the answer is to follow the Constitution more closely, or work together, or be bipartisan, or any other term you can think of, if you think that will fix the problem, then you're sadly mistaken. Oh, those things that I said, they might help and might make it look better, but that's not the fix. The answer is to come back to God. Our nation needs a mighty revival. But how is that done? I mean, just saying that sounds hopeless. Where would we even start? Well, we start right here 
in our church. If we determine as a church body to focus first on God, each one of us individually in our own lives, and if the church down the road does the same thing, and the next church does the same thing, and so on and so on, that domino effect will start to build. What I'm trying to say is if you see a godless person doing godless things, you kind of overlook it a little bit because you expect that. But if you see church people doing godless things, then something's wrong. And I've said this many times, but I'm very concerned in our church circles today, there's way too much complacency about things of God. And I'm not pointing fingers at anyone in particular. In general, there is a great complacency. And I feel like I may be in that group. Am I as focused on being putting God first as I should be? Ask yourself the question. Am I putting God first? Am I putting God in his, his proper place in my life? It is believed that Psalms 85 was written during or just after the return of Israel from captivity in Babylon. And as we read through this, you'll notice the first three verses show an acknowledgement of the goodness of God for, for bringing <coughs> people back. And then there's a prayer for restoration. And then there's a period of waiting on God toward the end of the chapter. And while we all know that Scripture was written during a completely different period of history, and really most of it doesn't, it really all of it doesn't fit our culture, so to speak. However, it can be applied quite easily because humans are still human and God is still God. That hasn't changed. Evil and truth have not changed. So let's look at this psalm and see how we can apply it to our time period. How can we apply the truths that the psalmist wrote here? The issues facing us as a church and as a nation right now. So follow along with me. We're going to read Psalm 85 of the chapter. Lord, you have been favorable to your land. You have brought back the captivity of Jacob. You have forgiven the iniquity of your people. You have covered all their sin. Selah. You have taken away all your wrath. You have turned from the fierceness of your anger. Restore us, O God, of our salvation, and cause your anger toward us to cease. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your mercy, Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people and to his saints, but let them not turn back to folly. Truly his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth have met together, righteousness and peace have kissed. Truth shall spring out of the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yes, the Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and shall make his footsteps our pathway. This psalm is a prayer for revival. And I think that concept can really apply right now. Don't you? As I told you a moment ago, this psalm is divided into three parts. The first is a cause for reflection. The second is a cry for revival. And the, fourth, and the third is a call for response. So let's look at the cause for reflection. If you look back at the first three verses, you'll see a reflection of God's blessing. In verse 1, God was favorable to Israel. He brought them back to their own land. In verse 2, God blessed them with forgiveness for their iniquity. In verse 3, they're praising God because he's no longer angry with them and judging them for their iniquity. <clears throat> I don't think it takes much of a genius to see the comparison of those three verses to where we're at right now. Israel was grateful to God for bringing them back. They were free to worship God as they wanted to. Do you know what? We are still free to worship God in America. I'm going to try to put this into words, and I hope it comes out right. But I struggle with all the outrage about our religious freedoms being removed. And hear me out. I'm not saying I'm not concerned about it. I do think 
our freedoms of being afraid of the religion are being eroded. I do believe that. But what concerns me is that there's so many that say our religious freedoms are being eroded and taken away, but they're not changing anything. In other words, if there's such a fear that someday we might not be able to meet in church, why isn't there a mass influx into church right now? We're still free to do that. Why is so many other things becoming more important than church? If someone is so concerned that prayer is being removed from so many institutions, why aren't they praying more? Are we reading the Bible that we're afraid is being taken away from us? Are we reading it more? There may be a day when we can't read it. Can't imagine that, but there could be a time. I mean, how many of you can say you've got 10 to 15 or more Bibles in your home? Go to another country, they may be lucky to have one. See, we still have freedoms. But I feel that many people are saying their freedom, those freedoms are so important, yet they're not changing anything. They're not living that out. We can still praise God because we still have religious freedoms. So let's use those religious freedoms. Let's practice them. See, the human tendency is to focus on the negative. If a friend of yours or a spouse has so many wonderful and endearing qualities, yet there's one thing that really annoys you about them, what do you focus on? That one annoying thing. At least I do. I see some smiles. Apparently you do the same. That's what we as humans are trained or inbred to do. We focus on the negative. And because of this, I fear we're focusing on what we might be losing instead of focusing on what we still have. Let's praise God for religious freedoms that we do have. Some people in the world aren't so fortunate. Then the psalm reflects on God's forgiveness in verse 2. The word iniquity means a twisting and refers to moral perversity. God sent Israel to Babylon. He allowed them to go to Babylon, the very heart of idolatry, to cure them of idolatry. And this verse is thanking God for, for the forgiveness he gave to them. As soon as I said moral perversity and twisting, did that sound familiar? The Bible is so relevant to our times. If there was ever a time when there's moral perversity and a twisting of the truth, it's right now. If I go through a list of all the ways we see around us where truth is being skewed and, and, and perverse things are being done and things are just so twisted or being performed, we'd be here for a long time. Everywhere we look, someone is doing something that is in direct opposition to God's laws. What's more is we see people doing things that are in direct opposition to natural laws. And you can fill in the blanks there. Satan has done his job well. And people are greatly confused at best, but also greatly seared in their consciences. When this psalm was written, Jesus had not yet been sacrificed on the cross for the sins of, of man. This psalm was referring to the forgiveness of sins offered by animal sacrifices. And I can't fathom, nor do I even want to try, what it would have been like to, to try to get freedom from my sins by throwing an animal on a, a slab of, of wood or, or brick and hoping fire came down. I mean, can you imagine that? It would have been so incomplete. And kind of sad, too, if you had to do it to your pet. Jesus Christ came to offer complete forgiveness, and we need to reflect on how truly wonderful that is. And unfortunately, there are many living today that are complete disregard of this. Either they haven't heard of it, or they don't care. And what I'm greatly concerned about is there are many in the church circles that are living like this. They say they're a Christian, but yet their lifestyles and their habits don't back that up. Folks, let's not forget what Jesus Christ did for us. Let's praise Him for it. And live our lives like it really makes a difference. In verse 3, the psalm is again reflecting on how God removed his anger from Israel by allowing them to return to their own land. 
Now, this type of speech isn't, isn't used much today. Uh, we hear more about God's love than God's wrath. But the Bible, however, does give a very clear and balanced picture. God forgives, but he doesn't allow his allow sin to go unpunished. Romans 1, 8, 1, 18 talks about God's wrath towards sin. His wrath is directed towards sin. God hates sin. And this psalm is taking, is taking the time to reflect on the truth that God has removed his wrath from Israel because of their sins. How many of you have heard the phrase, I wonder how long God is going to bless America? How long is he going to ignore the sins that America as a country have committed? And I personally think we're seeing some of the results of, of those inconsistencies now. But we need to reflect and realize in our own personal lives what it means to have God's blessing and for doing what pleases him. It has to start with us personally. Now let's look at a call for or a cry for revival. Even as the psalmist was wondering about God's anger, he made a bold request for the Lord to bring revival. Revival isn't something that people create or, or bring. It's, it's the work of the Lord Almighty. The psalmist says, how long will this continue? How long will God be angry with this sin? Revival means renewal, recovery, a reviving. This word <clears throat> correctly used is something that is already there, but died out. It, bring, it brings that back. A person who never accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior cannot be revived. They need redeemed. Therefore, this word revival is for the church. What does the psalmist say in verse 6? Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? So it says your people. Talk about the church. This was written about a people who believed or once believed in God. We say that America needs revival, and that's absolutely right, but who is the revival for? We can say that corrupt governments, drugs, gangs, violence, and whatever else you can think of is the source of this nation's problems. It's not. The source of this, of this country's problem is people that once believed in the power of God and turned to him for guidance and everywhere in their lives no longer do so. That's the problem in our country. A revival means that people that once called upon God turn back and call on him again. And 2 Chronicles 7.14 says it best, and you could probably quote it with me. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. If we as God's people, the ones that know him, as our friend and savior, if we humble ourselves and realize that even us personally has strayed in our fervor of following him like we should, if we stand up and be the example for the rest of the nation to see, the rest of the nation that desperately needs to turn to God in prayer and show them the only way to turn this thing around is through prayer and seeking God's face, then God will bring healing. When we have revival meetings at the church here, here at Montgomery, Many times it's kind of mistaken, like, oh, let's get some new people in and get them saved. And I'm not saying that can't happen. It's a good time for that. But revival is for the church. It's to revive, it's to refresh, it's to renew the people that are here. When we ask God to bring revival in our country, many times we're thinking about the next guy that desperately needs God. Do we realize that when we pray for revival... We are praying that God shapes us up personally. We can pray revive for revival all we want, but until we're willing for God to work in our own hearts, revival is not going to come. And do you think that might be the problem? Lord, bring a revival, but I'm not willing to do anything to bring that. I said earlier that revival isn't man-made. It only comes through God, and that's very true. But God won't bring revival unless we're willing to be revived. The question is, are we willing? Verse 7 is a very passionate plea. I can almost hear the desperation in the voice there, the one that wrote this. Show us your mercy, Lord. Please, please, grant us your salvation. We need it. Can you hear that? Then let's talk about a call for response. 
The implication of listening is that once a believer calls on God, they need to be willing to wait on his answer. And that's pretty tricky. It's pretty challenging. That can challenge even the most patient of souls. If believers really mean business when they call on God, then God will answer. And he will not speak in judgment. He'll speak in peace. In verse 9, the psalmist is looking to the future of Israel and mentions the glory that will dwell on the land down the road. And this was manifested in, in, in the presence of God, like, like when the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Of course, later and even presently, it's represented by God's glory revealed through Jesus Christ and the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, like we heard about Pentecost and those kind of things. <clears throat> Verse 10 is kind of, can we say weird? Odd? Maybe we don't understand the implications of it, but look at verse 10 again. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. King James Version says righteousness and peace have kissed, kissed each other. There are four attributes of God mentioned here. There's mercy, truth, righteousness, and peace. All of these attributes were brought into conflict when sin entered the world. Mercy wants to forgive the sinner. But truth insists that the wages of sin is death. God is righteous, but he also brings peace. And God solved this dilemma outside the walls of Jerusalem on the hill called Golgotha when Jesus Christ was nailed to the cross and shed his blood for our sins. He met the need, the demands of God's truth. His death provided forgiveness through grace. At the cross... Mercy and truth met together, or they kiss. If you want to put it in today's terminology, and, and it sounds kind of funny, but it really doesn't make sense, they kissed and made up. Mercy and truth. The worst thing you can do to your children is tell them to kiss and make up. <laughs> Hang them from their toenails is much more, much more enjoyable for them. I'm saying that from personal experience, let me tell you. <laughs> but that is what salvation is all about. It's something only God could do. And this call for revival was made years and years ago. This plea for revival was handed down through the generations. God answered that plea through his son's death on the cross. So we do have the answer. It's there. God did answer the request. And we as Christians need to fully accept this gift of salvation Jesus brings and by our testimony and a changed life, show people around us that God is still working and moving. Are we serious when we say we want a revival? Because if we really want the answer, we need to understand the answer is already here. And Jesus Christ is the answer. But it's really scary to me because how serious are we about getting back to God? I really feel like we're not as serious as we need to be. Because if we're really serious about bringing a revival, we as the church need to step up and show that we're serious about it. Revival is for us. We need to be the example. Are we willing to take the necessary steps to seek God and have Him direct us? At the end of the chapter, we read some very promising words in 12 and 13. Yes, the Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him, and shall make his footsteps our pathway. But how do we get there? We need to follow the correct steps. We can't just expect God to do good things just because he's good. If we're blatantly disobeying his principles, how is he going to bless us? We as Christians need to leave the charge because... It's us that needs a revival. May we practice verse 6. Oh, that you would revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you. Let's ask God for revival. Not for everybody else around us, but for me. Revive me. Revive us. Let's ask God to get us back to the place where we're following his path and allowing him to guide us. Because the only way to survive is for revival. We need a revival for survival.
I don't know how you feel when <coughs> you see things like an American flag blowing in the breeze or or like last night we were sitting in Hagerstown. I took the family down and um, did a little golfing last night and then realized that wherever we were golfing, they did the fireworks just next door, so it would be a good place to camp out. And we wouldn't have to find a parking place because we were already there. So we just sat back down in the ninth hole and watched fireworks. And uh, there was just fireworks all around us. And there was a real sense of patriotism there. I didn't see any misbehaving. Police presence was there and they were keeping the peace, but it really, I really, I, I didn't see that it was necessary. I don't know how you feel when you see all those things, but something rises up in me. I'm, I'm proud to be an American. But I tell you what, there are some real changes that need to be made in this country if we're to head in the right direction. And we need to ask ourselves, each one, am I willing to do what I need to do to make that change so others can see it? Revival starts with each one of us. Let's pause for a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, would you hear our cry for revival, but help us to make it personal that it starts with each one of us, that we are going to be willing to have you revive us personally, and that we can in turn be the example we need to be for others around us. We thank you and praise you for this great country we live in and for the independence that we celebrated. But Lord, above all that, we thank you for the freedom we have in you. And we praise you that you have offered this freedom through your son. If there's someone here that doesn't truly know that this morning, Lord, would you help them to know it? And in a church group like this, we expect that everyone knows you, but it may not be so. And would you help us to be assured that we know you? Give us a good week. Uh, be with everyone. Give them safety. And we thank you and praise you for being with us and being us here this morning. Amen. Amen. I know it's very warm outside. Um, so I feel like you need to stay and talk in here. Maybe you have to do it spaced apart. But I'm going to go ahead and go down.